So in the time that I've sort of been involved in bioinformatics, there is something that I've sort of consistently noticed, and that is that bioinformatics software is generally pretty bad. So compared to all the other kind of software that you interact with out there, um, think of the apps on your phone or um, on your computer or on your iPad. Bioinformatics software is borderline sort of broken most of the time that you need to use it. So if I was to sort of keep track of what I spend most of my time doing, I think a huge chunk of it will be used up by trying to install software and basically get it to run in the way that I expect it to run. So imagine if you were spending 50% of your time on your iPhone, just trying to install your favorite apps and getting them to work in the way that you expect them to work. There is no way anyone would put up with that, but that's basically the state of bioinformatics software at least genomics bioinformatics software. So in this video, I just kind of want to talk about what I mean by this, what's going on here, and also why I think this has happened. Why is bioinformatics software so bad? And maybe talk about how we can try and fix this if we possibly can. So let's jump right into it and talk about my four reasons why I think bioinformatics software is so bad. So for the most part, the software that I've sort of interacted with is developed by academics at universities or other research institutes. So basically you will have a research group which is led by a principal investigator or a PI and they will have a couple of postdocs maybe and maybe a few PhD students and maybe some master's students in there as well and let's say they work at the University of Manchester and they have a problem that they want to solve with, uh, with some software. So they build that software and they publish the software on GitHub and then they write a paper about it and it's all great and everyone loves the software and it works, it works well and people use it and it's amazing. But then because academia is very volatile, people, people sort of tend to move around a lot in academia. Research groups can move to other places as well. So our little example group here, so they could move down to London to maybe UCL or something because the PI has been offered a position there. And maybe when they get to their new research institute, to their new university, the software that they developed before is not a priority for them anymore. Maybe they're working on something else that the new university is kind of prioritizing. And then basically what you have is that the software that they developed with the old institute is not being supported anymore. And when dependencies break or they get updated to a version that doesn't work with the software, then you basically have software that's that's broken and that doesn't work anymore. So with some of the software that I've used before, I think this has happened quite a few times where academics just move on to something else, which is absolutely fine, but it doesn't mean that the software that they once built and they were supporting just doesn't work anymore. Um, so yeah, I absolutely understand that sort of researchers move on to other places and they maybe have other priorities. Um, but yeah, ultimately it leaves us with non-functional software, which is, which is not ideal. So I think if people's software is on GitHub, um, other people can maintain the software, um, even though the original authors have moved away. I'm not entirely sure on that, but I think that is an option with GitHub. Um, so yeah, occasionally you get other citizens, random citizens, sort of uh, maintaining the software when the academics are not um, actively uh, maintaining it anymore. So the next reason I think bioinformatics software is not the best, so is that as far as I can tell, developing good pieces of software is incredibly expensive. So when you consider that fact with the fact that a lot of the people writing bioinformatics software are at research institutes like universities, where the budgets are limited for this kind of thing, for software development, and the fact that people move around quite a lot in academia, I think you end up with this situation where the, the software that you get is, is not the best, where you have a few issues with it, maybe a lot of bugs um, that may or may not get sort of fixed. 
during the life cycle of the of the software and of the code. If you look at some of the really well-funded um, research institutes, they tend to produce more reliable and better pieces of software. Again, in my theory, it's because that they have the resources to do that kind of thing. So a great example of this is GATK, which is funded or is under the umbrella of the Broad Institute in Massachusetts, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In my experience, GATK kind of produced the most reliable software and well-documented software um, in, in sort of the genomics bioinformatics space. And I don't think it's a coincidence that they are under a really big, well-funded institute as well. So you also see GATK um, updating their software really, really regularly, like way more regularly than any other sort of piece of software I've come across in bioinformatics. Again, I think it's because they have the resources to do that kind of thing. So the last kind of reason I can see for why bioinformatics software is not the best and it can be a little bit frustrating to work with sometimes is to do with kind of the nature of bioinformatics. And again, I'm mostly talking about genomics bioinformatics here because that's what I have experience in, but we don't have a whole lot of standards in, in this field. That's kind of a problem for the people developing tools for bioinformatics uh, workflows because some of the file types that we sort of depend on are not particularly well defined and you don't necessarily know how to deal with those with those file types so a really good example of this is the vcf file so vcf files kind of describe uh, variations or mutations um, that are detected between a sample and the reference genome that sounds like a fairly simple task, except all of the tools that detect the variation in the sample do things a little bit differently and they give you sort of different metrics when they finish doing their analysis. Even though there is a standard for how to write a VCF file, so not every piece of software uses the same um, standards. So at this point, I think we have a VCF version 4.3. Uh, but there is some tools that are still making VCF 4.2 and 4.1 or even earlier. And if you pass that on to another piece of software, it might not know what to do with anything older than VCF 4.2 or 4.3 or whatever the latest version is. So yeah, it makes developing software that deals with those file types really, really difficult. And yeah, this doesn't just happen with VCF files, it happens with all sorts of all sorts of file types that we work with in bioinformatics so there's also issues with terminology as well there's a whole bunch of terminologies in bioinformatics that mean different things depending on the context or who's saying them which again is not ideal when you're trying to build software um, that sort of works reliably every time and it's even more difficult when you consider just how expensive it is to develop software and the people who are sort of in charge of making all of this software and the positions that they might find themselves in. So suggestions of how might we fix this? What can bioinformatics do to sort of get over this problem of software that doesn't necessarily play nice with all other pieces of software or software that's just impossible to install or software that straight up just doesn't work anymore because some dependency is broken. So yeah, given all the reasons why I think this whole situation has come about, it's really difficult to sort of come up with any um, realistic solutions to this problem. So yeah, I would say I'm really glad that there is institutes like the Broad Institute that sort of fund uh, things like GATK um, that at least gives us really good, reliable software that's updated pretty regularly. So it would be nice if we got more of those um, types of institutes that have the sole purpose of developing and maintaining this type of software so that the hard work doesn't fall on academics all the time um, who have other pressures on them as well.
So another thing is utilizing package managers a lot more in this field. Anaconda is probably the one that I use the most in the kind of work that I do. So it basically allows you to download uh, software and all its dependencies in one go. So Anaconda is pretty great. It, it works really, really well. Um, the only problem with it is that not every piece of software is um, uploaded or is available on, on Anaconda. So it would be really good if we saw more pieces of software um, uploaded onto Anaconda. So it's just so much less of a hassle to worry about dependencies. So that's it. That's my sort of little theory on why bioinformatics software can be pretty bad sometimes. Yeah, I do spend a lot of my time just basically trying to get some of this stuff to work. So it seems like a massive waste of time, especially when we've got the really cool stuff of um, analyzing the, the data that we have in bioinformatics and getting some um, interesting insights into into all that data it's a bit of a shame that you have to spend so much time just installing software and dependencies when you could be doing all that really interesting work so yeah i think i'll leave it there for now uh, thank you for watching and i will see you in the next video